are from the State Agriculture and Development Committee. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what that organization does, uh, but Jess and I are the coordinators for the Next Generation Farmer Program. Uh, my name is Brendan Pearsall. My background was uh, I, I went to Rutgers for Agriculture and Food Systems. Before that, I was actually a carpenter for 10 years, so this is a change of career for me. But um, you know, after working or after going to Rutgers, worked at a commercial diversified vegetable farm for a few years, started my own cut flower farming business, and then in 2020 had the opportunity to work with Middlesex County agent Bill Lubick and start the Rutgers Beginner Farmer Training Program. So for the past four years, I was the coordinator for that program before these positions opened up at the State Ag Development Committee. And uh, since May, this is what Jess and I have been doing. We're building this program from scratch, and we'll talk a little more about that as we get into it. But uh, we'll give Jess a chance to introduce herself. You guys can start with your phone, please, thanks. Um, and I was farming full-time for the past eight years, so I did a full-time apprenticeship in 2015, worked in a diversified veggie CSA, and we also raised pigs. Uh, I really wanted to do stuff on my own, but at first I found it was really, really difficult and considering um, opportunities for equity and owning land and things like that. Um, so I ended up not pursuing it, um, feeling like I was really unable to be successful there and was really excited when these jobs opened up because I'm hoping to help folks in that same position and make it a little bit easier because farming's difficult enough. <laughs> okay. So just to give you an outline of what we're going to talk about today, um, so I'm going to give you just a very quick introduction to the SABC and the programs that are run through that agency. I'm going to give you an overview of Next Generation Farmer Program, and hopefully we are some folks who can help you out as you get started in agriculture here. Uh, we're going to talk about preparing yourself to be a farmer. We're going to talk about preparing your plan for your farm. We're going to give you some stories of things that can potentially go wrong and, you know, based on stuff that we've seen firsthand. We're going to talk about due diligence in land access, making sure that you really know what you're getting into. And uh, we're going to talk about the costs that are really involved with farmland in New Jersey right now. Um, some of this is going to come off as sort of cautionary. We see a lot of people that kind of jump in, get in way too quick and start putting down big money on land or racking up big debts before they have a full picture of what they're getting into. So we're, we're, we're here to kind of address that. So the State Ag Development Committee is uh, in but not of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, so we're kind of nested off to the side on the same floor as New Jersey Department of Agriculture. The main things that the SADC runs are the Farmland Preservation Program. So as you drive around and you see signs that look like Alyssa's shirt over there, um, you will, th those are farms that have been preserved through the state Farmland Preservation Program, usually in cooperation with counties and municipalities, sometimes nonprofits as well. Just like Zell's Mushroom Farm yesterday, the sign was out front, we didn't point it out. There you go. So um, there's, there's some benefits to that, that, you know, in, in terms of funding, there are some grants available to preserve farms that are not available to unpreserved farms, things like wildlife fencing, soil and water, conservation cost share grants. So, you know, we encourage people to look for preserved farmland when possible. It tends to be a little more affordable than non-preserved land, and there's some extra benefits that come along with it. Uh, the SADC also oversees the state right to farm program. Uh, right to farm is a set of legal protections that if you're following certain agricultural management practices can protect you from zoning ordinances, nuisance, nuisance complaints, and things like that. There's a legal process through your county agricultural development boards that if you're getting those kinds of issues and you are a commercial farm, they can help you out with some of that. Um, we also have an agricultural mediation program, which we like to promote. If you're having an issue with a loan, with a landowner, with a town, you can apply for mediation and get in a neutral third party to sit down with you and the other party, talk through the issues and help try to come to a resolution that doesn't involve lawyers and going to court and things like that. Uh, Jess and I also uh, administer the state Landlink program. So Landlink is a website. Uh, it's a matching website where farmers and or landowners can post land that's available. Farmers looking for land can post their profiles. They can search each other and find options to connect. So if you're looking for land, uh, creating a Landlink profile can be an option. And like I said, we'll send you some resources at the end to help you do that. And then Next Generation Farmer, which is our program that we're going to talk about here today. 
So just a very quick overview of that. This was a program that was encouraged and funded by the New Jersey State Legislature for SADC to create a program to support new and beginning farmers in the state. This started on May 20th of this year, so we are in very early development. This program is being built as we speak. We are looking for input from new and beginning farmers, established farmers, ag service providers. So we've got surveys, we're going to be holding focus groups, we're going to share those with you. But we are really right now trying to learn about what everybody's needs are and what the state can do to support new and beginning farmers really from all backgrounds. Whether you're coming from a farm family, whether you're a veteran, an urban farmer, new and beginning, brand new to farming, you know, we're trying to see what the needs of all these different communities are and what we can do to help support them, get them started, and get them into agriculture. Uh, we're doing a lot of coordination and collaboration through this program, which is what brings us here today. Um, we've been talking to folks and partner organizations from all around the state. So really, we want folks to be able to think of us as kind of a one-stop shop. If you need a connection, if you need a resource, if you're not sure where to turn to, you can come to us, and it's our job to know the network of service providers, the people who are out there to help you and provide resources, resources and support, and to get you connected to the people who can help you. Um, so as I mentioned, we'd like your input, or we would like your input. You can go to our website um, at sadc slash nextgen. We have surveys available. We're going to be holding focus groups. So we'll send this information around and a sign-up sheet. But we would, at the very least, value your input in taking a survey to learn about what your unique needs and challenges are as you get involved in agriculture. So now, what's an OB for you now? <laughs> Handing it off to Jess. Do you want to do slides or you want me? I'll do this. Okay. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll stand over here and sip my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so, like Brendan was saying, the general theme of this presentation is going to be to take your time. Uh, when you're considering getting into farming, it can be very tempting to think, oh, I'll just buy some property, I'll get it started, I'll be a successful farmer. But often you see a lot of mistakes come up when people just kind of jump right in without really knowing the landscape. And maybe you do, and that's great too, and we're going to talk about those steps as well. Um, but if you do end up coming upon some property that you think is going to be perfect, you have to be really careful, don't make a quick decision, and there's a lot to consider. Um, you don't want to end up with a million dollar mortgage and not have the right plan in place because that can end up being very costly. Um, so first, we'd like to talk about self-assessment. This can be very important in determining what you're going to be doing with your farm property. Knowing yourself and your strengths and where you might need extra support is going to help guide your business plan. It's going to help guide your, your farm vision overall and what you would like to do. So there's a lot of things to consider and knowing where you fall into your plan is very important. So we're going to talk about some different entre entrepreneurial traits, excuse me, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that are common in a lot of um, successful farm operators. Uh, considerations for lifestyle preferences, because again, farming is a lifestyle. Uh, if you're going to do it full time, it's not just a job, it's a lot more than that, um, which I think everyone is very aware of. And then um, how to do a resource inventory. What do you have on your side? What do you bring to the table? Who's in your family? What can they bring to the table? Things like that. So some traits of successful entrepreneurs are up here. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. It doesn't mean that you have to have every one of these traits. It's just a way to start thinking, and I think it's more inspirational. Of, oh, what I do have this. I know I can be really good at this. I'm very passionate about farming and you know, growing food for my community. Um, I'm independent and self-reliant. I know I can work really hard and hold myself to these schedules. I'm creative. I really like to do different things with my own business, et cetera. So again, you don't have to have all of these, but it is great to start from these points. I think you can develop a lot of things about your business by knowing some of these traits about yourself very confidently. Uh, lifestyle preferences. What's your motivation for getting into farming? Do you want to connect with people? Maybe you should have a CSA where you get to see folks all the time. Uh, do you really not want to connect with people, which sometimes farmers don't really want to, so maybe you'd rather do something in wholesale, um, et cetera. So it's good to understand what are the economic reasons you're getting into this, what are the societal and cultural reasons, and environmental, are you really concerned about organic? Is it not that big of a priority to you? It really doesn't matter. It's just about defining it on paper and understanding how you're going to meet all your motivations with your farm opportunity. Um, and again, 
if your family is getting involved, you can't assume <laughs> that they're going to pitch in as much as you might expect in your mind. So it's good to have honest conversations. Avoid any hassles down the road. If you're thinking, oh, um, you know, my brother-in-law is so great at fixing equipment. Is he going to be there every weekend to kind of answer that call and come out to the farm, etc.? cetera? Um, so again, it's not make or break. It's just good to understand the honest truth about people you might be expecting to work with you. Have conversations, be honest. Hey, do you think you'd be willing to do this? Are you as invested in this as I am? Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of other aspects to consider, things that everybody kind of deals with. Do you have debt? Are your parents aging? Are you going to need to consider, you know, costing or excuse me, affording care for them as they get older? Um, is it really important to you that you meet with a certain group during the week every week? Do you have a church group? Things like that. And time off is a big one for farming. And again, I don't think anyone thinks that farmers are taking a lot of time off, so it's no surprise there. Uh, but it can be really important for some people. It's a big surprise that it is often 12-hour days. You're not taking holidays off. You know, if you have animals on your farm, you're out there every day. If you have vegetables, you have to go check every day, multiple times a day, things like that. You're running irrigation until late into the night. You're out weekends. So it's, it all plays a very important role in shaping your, your business and what type of agriculture you go into. Um, and resource inventory. There's a lot of good worksheets we could also send to anyone who signs up on our sign-up sheet. Um, just kind of writing everything down on paper, like I was saying. What are your family members bringing to the table? What are your friends who are really interested in you starting a farm bringing to the table? What's their knowledge? Um, are they good at business management? Do they have skills where they can assist you in doing a cash flow worksheet? What's their experience? What are, what are their business skills? Do they have a lawnmower that you can borrow on weekends? It's good to understand what you already have at your fingertips as you jump in. So again, knowing your personal and business mission statement, your goals, your objectives, to stay consistent with your plan and stay on track, you just need to be really sure of where you are at coming into it. Um, do a very in-depth self-assessment. Be really honest with yourself, and that will just help you as you move forward. And the big takeaways for this is these are all things we can work on. Like I said, that list of traits, there is no reason you can't develop a lot of those um, different skills, like business management skills. It's easy to take a course, take a workshop, like we were saying before, as Brenda was discussing, we're collaborating. There's already so many wonderful programs in New Jersey that are helping people get into farming. So you can see what else is out there and take advantage of those and, and work on those skills. So no farmer is born with these habits. It's not magic. You learn it, you get involved, you learn from other people in the community, and you can develop them and work on them. Um, so there can be, even though there's some big risks with getting involved in agriculture, uh, again, a tremendous amount of time gets spent on uh, different operations. There could be family strain, depending on if they don't really like that you're away on the farm that much. Um, it all depends on the situation, of course. There's obviously always a risk of failure and financial loss. But the rewards are really excellent, especially when you're considering it to like a conventional type of job. Um, I know I found that when I was farming, because there is a degree of independence. Obviously, you still have to stick to the market pressures and things like that. Uh, but you have creative freedom. It's up to you how you want to market things, how you want to sell, like what activities you want to do on a weekend if you're interested in agritourism. Uh, there's a lot of fun to be had in running your own business. Um, and there can be financial benefits if you set everything up correctly and you really tap into things. You are in charge of your finances. You can make all those decisions and you could possibly make more than a conventional job. Um, so. If you think you're ready to buy after that discussion, and you maybe have already done a lot of that work, um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about understanding the full responsibilities when you do look at a farm property. What are some of the make or break things that you need to understand? Um, sometimes certain aspects of a property might be a little hidden. Um, maybe you don't know the right people to talk to. So Brendan's gonna talk about due diligence in a few slides. Um, but one of the most important things is building a good team to have with you as you go look at farm properties, as you discuss financial options, um, get a great real estate agent, accountants, farm advisors, uh, lenders and attorneys, and try to find folks who are familiar with agriculture because there are a lot of different rules around ag use on properties and not everyone understands that. So you definitely don't want to work with someone, have them tell you, oh, absolutely, you can do this here, no problem. And then you 
put down a huge mortgage, start working, and then the town comes up to you like, I don't know who told you that, but you certainly can't do that. <laughs> yeah, and this is something in the farm advisor category we'll bring up a few times, mm -hmm. your local county extension agent. Yes. Get to know your county extension agent in the county where you're looking to farm. They can be one of the best resources for that information. Uh, okay, and so to talk a little bit more about considering being ready to buy, I wanted to mention uh, National Young Farmers Coalition, they have a ton of great resources, including this land affordability calculator. Uh, it gets really in depth. You can enter so much information about a property, your personal assets, etc. Um, and it really walks you through the financing, the cost of a property, how you can get certain financial statements together, and then eventually it gives you the affordability. Like, are you, are you ready to buy this property? What does it look like down the line? And you can download these, which is great to bring to your financial advisor or to a business loan agency. Um, FSA will be here on Thursday, so they're gonna talk about all the different things that they take into consideration when they approve someone for a loan. So here's an example, as you can see, um, there's a lot of opportunities to add different things in this affordability calculator. Uh, there's different FSA loan rates in here, which it, the website says it was um, all updated in April, but I think we looked, it definitely could be updated again. Uh, but, you know, lease to own, is there a conservation easement that's a potential to help reduce the rate of the property like Brendan was mentioning? What are your taxes, insurance, closing costs, uh, capital investments, your gross income, and that could be off-farm income, that's an important consideration. Uh, what are your gross sales, your operating expenses, and it, it's really comprehensive. Um, there's a lot of things on here that you might not even consider, so it's a great exercise to go through. You don't have to have a farm property in mind. You can just type in some numbers and just get some interesting ideas. A business balance sheet. And then finally, like I was saying, an affordability outlook. Um, it can tell you if it really is worth the property, if you're paying too much, if you're underpaying, etc. And again, it's always important to consult with an accountant, get some estimates on things that if you're not as familiar with running a business, um, for example, me, <laughs> uh, they'll really help remind you about carrying costs. You know, what, what is that building gonna cost for maintenance? How can they kind of give you an idea of what the real cost is gonna look like? Um, and then they have this wonderful story about a slow approach to owning farmland, like Brent and I have been focusing on. It's not just about jumping in. So this is a great example. Uh, Tim from the Young Farmer Coalition Worked on a farm for seven years with four of them as a manager. Um, in that time, he connected with a lot of local farmers in the ag community and was able to, again, work on developing that team of people he could really rely on. Uh, worked on a friend's farm and slowly acquired equipment for two years after that. And then took some off-farm work, really developed his business plan, figured out all the numbers, and started searching for properties. Um, you know, if you step onto the first farm and it's perfect, that's great. But realistically, like in Tim's story, he looked at 100 farm properties to really find the right one, what's going to make sense financially, uh, what has the right infrastructure for his agricultural operation, is there a house, do you want to live there? Um, and then even at the end of the day of his story, he was able to afford it through conservation easements and a lease to own arrangement. So still not that jump right in and purchase it outright. So uh, I'm curious, how does this timeline fit everyone's um, expectations for purchasing farmland or getting on farmland? <coughs> Makes sense? Yep. Okay, great. That's good. All right. Um, so as we've been doing uh, surveys to the ad community, we have been getting advice from established farmers. and. All in all, everybody definitely uh, hones in on the idea of slow down. They see a lot of new folks just jumping right in, starting their ag operation, again, not doing their due diligence, which we're going to discuss, and then, unfortunately, kind of failing or, or getting really disappointed by the whole process. Um, it's really great to get experience and connect with the ag community first. They can be hugely advantageous to be uh, connected with. And you get to test drive before you buy, right? Just like a car. Who doesn't test drive a car before they buy it? <laughs> so you want to make sure that farming fits your lifestyle goals, that you're energized by that kind of work. It's not, if you see it as drudgery, then it's, it's not going to work. Um, it's not a job. It is a calling. It's something that you want to do every single day, all day, and that you're severely passionate about. 
Um, and then it's a great way to identify your entrepreneurial skills on somebody else's bill. If you determine like, oh man, I'm actually really great at promoting uh, the farm on social media for my farm manager, that's awesome to know and that fits into your self-assessment worksheet. Um, are you great at connecting with customers, etc.? So in general, it's great to start small, avoid all those pitfalls that we're talking about, and then that also gives you time to establish a credit history um, and a business history, which is required for many different financial loans and programs for farmers um, in general. And again, you'll learn more on uh, Thursday, FSA will be here, but even programs through Farm Credit East, um, in general, they require about three years of actual business history and credit history to show that you know what you're doing. That's one of the biggest things we'll hear when we talk to FSA, you know, mm -hmm. new farmers coming to them, just not having that background, not having that history, and they can't help them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it history though of your, with your own business or could that be a history of performance through another business like this part-time or as a manager or something like that? It, that helps, so they do want to see three years of management experience, but they also typically want to see three years of some kind of financial records. So you could be running a business operation on the side and building up some of those financial records. The management certainly helps. But it's a balance of a lot of factors, but they do want to see that you've actually done some sort of business now. Does that management have to be farm-centric, or can it be like any type of business management? I, you know what? That would be a great question to ask them on Thursday. I know they're going to want to see a lot that's farm-centric, but whether or not they, there are some provisions in there for substituting different types of experience or training programs or work experience, so I, I would float that to them when they come out and do that talk. That might be an option. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely ask FSA about the details because obviously they know better than we do, but um, I'm pretty sure you can start an LLC on the side, which last I checked is just $50 in New Jersey, and just start purchasing some things. Um, maybe you work with your farm manager and they're like, hey, I really do want to support you with this. How can my business help do business with you? Mm -hmm. You know, do certain things in exchange and, and get that history on paper. Um, so there's an opportunity there as well. Um, but again, check with FSA on all of that. <laughs> Um, so here's some quotes from our established farmers who we've been talking with. Uh, again, a lot of the big points to be helpful, search out existing farmers. Chances are they've done it and they have either succeeded or failed already. So talk with them first, you know, hey, have you ever grown this uh, variety of this carrot? And you're like, oh yeah, that's terrible, don't do that. Or like, you, you really can't make it grow in the spring. It always goes to flower too soon, so don't even waste your time, seed it in the fall. So it's always great to have somebody to talk to about farm specific issues. Uh, work hard and put in lots of time. Again, I'm sure everyone in this room understands that is a part of farming. Have that solid business plan, know the strengths and weaknesses, right? Know where you might fall a little short in an area and there is no problem. Instead of wasting your time trying to push forward on that, just ask someone you know who's good at it. Um, start small, work up, and then also don't be afraid to get an off-farm job. It really helps and a lot of farmers do that. Um, and again, farming is a calling. Don't give up, work hard, and don't be shy. Get yourself out there and get to know people. Um, and obviously you're gonna be hearing from a lot, of, a lot of organizations from the ag community this week. Uh, here's a quick list, it's not exhaustive, um, but we just wanted to throw some quick ones up there that you can search. Um, I was gonna throw in the hyperlinks, but it ended up being very, very wordy, so we can send those again to you. Um, but your NOFA, which I believe did they already? Did they? Yeah, well, Demi right? came in and spoke briefly because we are program under right, right now. and that too. So I'm sure everyone's aware. Um, so they have all these groups have different events, workshops, newsletters that you can really get plugged into, and again, meet a lot of farmers through those. So it's an easy way to walk up to somebody like, "Hey, I really love that you're farming this. Uh, let's chat," and they're more than likely going to be really happy to speak with you. Uh, county boards of agriculture, county ag development boards. Those are two different things. The NJ Ag Society has an ag leadership development program. They also have the organization Farmers Against Hunger, which does a lot of gleaning opportunities. So just a plug for the County Board of Ag. So mm -hmm. up until last month, I had never been to the County Board of Ag meeting. So I showed up and hung in. Tuesday, Wednesday evening, you know, farmers, nice people. And in this case, I gave them my pitch and they said, well, let's gift you guys 500 bucks for this boot camp. Yeah, I'm not saying you go there to get money, but again, now, and then the guy with the hat, right, here's the other connection. So Scott Vaughn, I said, hey, this other vendor, he doesn't know if he can come through with the hats. Scott's like, I told you, he's like, I got it for you. So 
Again, you don't know if you don't stick your hand out and show up at these places. You gotta be willing to open up your mouth and ask these questions that like you said, don't be shy. Right. Most county boards of ag, they love to see new faces in there. Yes. They love to get new questions. They love people that are curious about their work and what they're doing. It's a great networking opportunity to meet some of the most established and experienced farmers in your given county. And I would say 99% of them are more than happy to talk with you. And if they are that 1% that's a little grumpy, you just show up enough times and then they're like, all right, whatever, I'll talk to you. <laughs> so, Even the ones that are persistent. a little grumpy, they'll, they'll still help you out. They'll just yeah. be grumpy about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then we can't say enough about connecting with your Rutgers Cooperative Extension agent. Um, that was Brendan's past life as a Rutgers Are You Ready to Farm coordinator. Uh, they're an incredible group of folks who are, again, very, very knowledgeable in their fields and their topics. Um, it's a really excellent resource, and they do a ton of programs throughout the state. Can you talk a little bit, either one of you, about that program? Yeah. So For a minute, just so they know, because we haven't talked about it yet. Okay. Yeah, so Rutgers Cooperative Extension uh, is a is a arm of Rutgers University. So here's Rutgers University, the big land-grant college. Under them is the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. So they're doing a lot of the agricultural research. They've got plant breeders, they're doing market trials. They're involved in a lot of different research activities throughout the state. Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the public facing outreach arm of that. So they take that research that's coming down from the university and they're the ones that communicate it out to you. There's, there are Cooperative Extension offices in every county in the state and most of the counties also have an agricultural agent as part of that office. That agricultural agent's job is to help farmers. So they, they will help farmers in their area, they have different specializations, but in any given county, your cooperative extension agent can be one of the first people that you go to. They can help connect you to the County Board of Agriculture. They can help introduce you to other established farmers. If you go to them and tell them, you know, here's kind of what I want to do for my business, you know, who should I talk to? They can help you with that. They can help you with soil tests. They can help you with vehicle registration, water certificates. So it's a really great resource um, and a great touch point just to get connected to Rutgers, get connected to the Cooperative Extension, and they do tons of educational outreach, workshops, everything like that. You just, you just brought up a great point. Talk about your tractor going off property and what you need. Oh, I, that's yeah. something we haven't talked about. Yeah, so I, that, yeah, I, that, so in the regulation area, you know, if you're driving your tractor down the road, you need to take it from one field to the other, there's farmer plates. So if you see the tractor going down the road, there's actually a specific type of, of <coughs> registration and plate that you need to have on it to do that legally, your cooperative extension agent can help you with that paperwork, help get those plates. So it's really a great county by county touch point to get more connected to agriculture is that extension office. You have a question out there. Thank you. Do you know what's going on with Rutgers uh, agricultural program? Because I was gonna use veteran benefits um, this past fall, chapter 31, I was gonna try to use it as I don't get the GI bill because I've been out too long. And I went online, and for the fall, the program said it's been suspended or whatever, and then there was like a, kind of a message to be contacted if you're interested in the spring, but there wasn't any way to like register anything. It was like, it looks like it's like halted or something or something. Was this wrong. the beginner farmer program? No, just like, or, just like the Rutgers University of New Brunswick, the agricultural, I don't know if, it's, if that's a cook campus or not. Oh, for the, like the ag degree program? Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. on there and it was just like, there's nothing, there's something going on right now where they're not. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if you had any. Um, and this is affiliated with like the Office of Continuing Education too, right? The, this cooperative extension? Cooperative extension, not, not exactly. Um, without going too deep, there's a Rutgers has a lot of different silos. Mm -hmm. There are extension agents that run courses through continuing in professional education, but they're kind of their own separate areas. There's some overlap, but they're 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 different. Rutgers is is an intertwined beast of <laughs> different organizations and offices. Yeah. If you have any other questions at the end, yeah, I, I, I can, I, I can talk more about this for sure. <laughs> North Jersey Resource Conservation and Development and Food Shed Alliance of the Safe Program. Yeah. The test is here in the back. Um, uh, they're a great program. They are in Northwest Jersey, uh, but I think they are considering expanding to some additional locations in the future. But they have farm incubator plots, they have fantastic resources, events, and workshops. So, also be sure to connect with them. Um, again, just to really reiterate the fact that once you get connected with the ag community, 
you start showing your face, everyone starts to recognize you and they will certainly bring you into the fold and advocate for you, uh, even when you're not there. They're an incredible group of folks. So that's a great first step that's really easy and fun to do. Um, and then if we're talking about getting experience, if you have no experience working on a farm, it's definitely a strong suggestion that you get some. Uh, it's good to work at least two full seasons. I've worked on farms where, man, the weather's perfect, you get an inch of rain every week, there's no pests, it's like, oh, this is the best job ever. And then you get seven inches of rain in one month the next year. Or you're like this, where we've gotten about, in some areas of New Jersey, two-tenths of rain over the past five months. So yeah. we're in severe droughts in some areas of the state. So. It's good to get the full picture of ag. Uh, there are some really rough years, because again, it's not just going and doing a job. It really depends on forces that are totally out of your control, which for some is super exciting and exhilarating. You love the challenge. You can pivot really quickly, like, all right, we gotta shift gears now. Or it can be just really difficult, and if that's the case, again, just understand those things and understand where you fit and how you can bring certain things to those kinds of challenges. Um, there's a lot of ways to get connected with local farmers in your area. You can check out localharvest.org, which is a great webpage that just lists farms all throughout the state. You can go to a local's farm, local farmer's market and just start talking to somebody who you're like, oh wow, they're, you know, whatever they're selling looks really great. Let me chat with them a bit more, understand their practices, get to know their personality, and if they are someone you'd like to work with. Uh, you can check out ATRA, Appropriate Technology Transfer for Rural Areas. I know I found some farm jobs on there, and we would also post our apprenticeships on there. Yeah, do you guys know that's who runs the Arm to Farm Boot Camp that I've been talking to the residents oh, about, know. right? So 1.0 and 2.0. That's actually based in the back to the Reagan food insecurity days is where that program gets its uh, history from. Nice. Yeah, they're a great that. program. Yeah, I wasn't aware. Um, NOFA New Jersey has an online classifieds page, some farmers post opportunities there, and then again, contact your Rutgers County Extension agent, yeah. um, which sometimes it can be a little hard to navigate through their um, resources to figure out who your county agent is in particular, so again, you can always email us, and Brendan is so well-versed in Rutgers. I know all those guys. So yeah. <laughs> you need help finding your guy, let me know. Yeah. So now we have a nice little uh, break slide because that was a lot. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so here, look at this pretty. Look at the dream farm before yeah. we talk about why you can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So business and land considerations. So do your self assessment. You think, okay, I want to go for this. I want to be a farmer. I think I have what it takes. Step one write it down, develop a business plan. So we have a business plan, we have our technical definition, which is it is a formal written document containing the goals of a business, the methods for attaining those goals, and the time frame for the achievement of those goals. That's helpful, um, but to me, what a business plan really represents is your ability to really think through what you're actually going to do. What is your actual goal? How are you gonna get there? It lays out those steps. It sets your baseline so that when things go crazy, and everything seems off the rails, it gives you something to look back to and be like, okay, what is my actual goal? What direction am I going? So it's very helpful, even as an additional self-assessment and planning tool, but it also is very, very functional in terms of securing business financing and a number of other things. So why do you need a business plan? To help you secure financing from lending to investors. If you go to Farm Credit, if you go to FSA, the first thing you're gonna see from you is that business plan. Um, if you're looking to explore options to expand your business, business planning is a great tool to explore a new enterprise. So you want to add livestock or you want to add an apple orchard. Business plan process, you can sit down, go through the steps and figure out, will this work for me? Does it make financial sense? How can I make this work if I add it to my business? Helps you organize all those ideas into clear one, two, three steps to get to where you want to go, and it helps you hold yourself accountable because you've set goals, you can look back at those goals, you can make sure that you're moving on. Now, I'm, I'm only talking about this at very high level. I'm not going to get, I have a whole like two hour business planning lecture that I've done before. I'm not getting into the weeds too far, but the thing to keep in mind is that this is, this is a project. A business plan is a project and you need to be prepared to put in the work. If you just kind of sit down and brain dump and type everything out on paper and don't put in the effort and the research, it's going to show. And the people who are reviewing that plan are going to be able to tell whether you put in the work or not. 
Um, you are really going to have to research and understand your industry. This is an industry that you should be passionate about, that you should care about, so you should really understand the ins and outs. You're going to want to talk to other farmers and marketers who are doing what you doing what you want to do so you can get their input and use that to inform your plan. You're going to want to talk to Extension and that county agent. Does this plan make sense for this county? Does this plan make sense for this farm that I'm looking at? It's a very conversational piece that involves a lot of research, a lot of connecting and networking to make sure that you're getting the best information in your plan that you can. And like I said, this should be something that you're passionate about. So, you know, even though it's writing up a report, it's, you know, it's a writing project, it's a writing project about something that hopefully you really care about and you really want to put the work in. So just general guidelines on the business plan. You want it to be realistic and accurate. The folks that are reading your business plan, the lenders that are reviewing this, they probably understand your industry. So if you're not accurate, if your projections are like, I'm gonna grow, I'm gonna grow 100% per year and sell $500,000 worth of tomatoes next year, they're gonna be like, this, this is pie in the sky. This doesn't make sense. It's not a document to be, you know, to, to make you know, bold, lofty projections. It's to be realistic. How can you grow? What can you actually achieve? Don't rely too much on jargon and acronyms that other people might not know. This is sort of just a self-check. You might be really into this one crop and this one part of the industry that might have different trade groups with their acronyms and specific jargon. Make sure you're defining all that. Make sure you're being very clear in your plan. Be as specific as you can possibly be. Instead of, you know, I need to buy a $10,000 tractor, tell me what kind of tractor. Tell me what implements you need for it. Tell me, does it need a PTO shaft? Does it need uh, a three-point hitch? What's the horsepower for that tractor? If you've got a specific model in mind, the more specific you can be with what you need, the more clear it is that you've done your research and you really understand what you're trying to do. Take time, do your research, and make good use of available resources. There are business planning resources out there. There are programs to the state, like the New Jersey Small Business Development Committee that can help with some of these things. There's the USDA has some great business planning websites, and then Ag Plan out of the University of Minnesota, this bottom link. Um, it can actually take you step by step. You plug in the information, and it helps you form that plan. So make use of those resources, put in the work, build a good <coughs> business plan. So now I'm going to tell you a quick story. So this story, uh, these, this, the, the farmer in real life is not named Joe. Um, so we're going to talk about this things that we've seen. You know, these are stories that we've heard, and this is as we get into considering buying land that I want you to really be cautious and understand what you're getting into. So, Farmer Joe found the perfect property. He had, he had a vision. He said, I want to have a property where I do some agritourism, pick your own, I want to host events, I want to have classes and pony rides and a bed and breakfast. And he's got this beautiful dream farm idea and he finds the perfect farm. It's got everything he needs for his dream farm. And he knows, like, if I don't buy this right now, someone's going to swoop in with cash and I'm going to lose the dream farm and I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do. So he goes ahead, he, he gets financing, he buys it. Now he's got this farm and he just starts running his events. He's hosting functions, he's holding classes. He's got weddings happening, the Airbnb, you know, the Airbnb is running, and he's advertising this all on social media. He's putting posts on his social media, here's what I'm doing, here's what's going on, come out this weekend for an event. Oh, what goes wrong? What happens? He didn't tell the township, <laughs> the county, the zoning <laughs> officer, and a whole bunch of other people. Right. <laughs> so what happens is that a neighboring farm who wanted to do all of these same things and had previously been denied by the town for doing a lot of these same things, sees all this on social media and says, hey, this guy can't be doing this stuff. What is this? And calls the town and says, hey, you need to take a look at this person's social media. They're right down the street. They're doing all the things you told me I can't do. Next thing you know, he's, he's getting letters from the town. He's getting summons to court. He said, you can't do this. You can't do that. If you want to host these kind of events, you need to get a variance. You need to have your farm as an event venue. This is an ag retention zone. You're only allowed to do ag use on this land. So this gets into legal issues. This maybe gets into some right to farm issues that might cover some of the things, but certainly not all of them. 
So now we're talking lawyers, we're talking money, we're talking time, and the clock's ticking. You know, this guy's trying to sell crops, he's trying to maintain his farmland assessment, he's trying to get his business running, and now he's spending time in hearings and talking to attorneys and doing things like this. The bed and breakfast? That was never allowed to begin with. Right. He bought this farm and had a bed and breakfast already. How great. Yeah, it turns out the last owner didn't tell the town either, but they didn't advertise it on social media. So the town didn't know that they were doing this illegal Airbnb on the side. So these are things that happen. You know, this is what happens when people jump in and they have a vision and they don't do the due diligence and understand what is actually allowed on this property that I want to buy. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that due diligence is and important items to understand before you buy the land. So obviously, things Joe could have done differently. He could have looked up the zoning codes, like Cliff said. Zoning codes, every town you can find your zoning code, they're online, every municipality in Jersey has an electronic code book, you can go online and look it up. That's not always helpful. It can be informative, it can be a good guide, but unless you're really good at reading like statutes and code books, you might not always understand what exactly they mean or what the definitions are for the terms that are being used. So what's the solution here is actually to talk to people. It's to have conversations. It's to go back to this, you know, what we've been saying. Talk to the officials in your town. Say, hey, this is kind of what I want to do. Is this allowed here? Talk to the neighboring farms. See what they've done before. What's been allowed, what hasn't. You know, is their code officer pretty lenient? He's going to cut you a break? Or is he, you know, like real tough and going to come and crack down because he doesn't like what you're doing? Talking to the local board of agriculture, talking to the county agent, just having conversations with the different ag stakeholders in that area to find out what's allowed and what's not. Due diligence, doing your homework. So what does this look like in, the, in farmland purchasing, this overall due diligence? We talked briefly from that example about zoning, but we need to talk about broadly, I'm interested in the property, what do I need to know before I go in? So first of all, you need to know your own goals. So that's the business plan. We have our business plan first that lays out, this is our goals, this is what I want to do. So now I can look for properties that fit those goals. Does the location of that property make sense and match the goals that you've laid out in your plan? What's the production history? Is there anything you need to be concerned about with what's been done on this farm in the past? What's the soil texture and quality? Does it work for what you want to grow and produce there? Dr. Heckman's going to talk a lot about this tomorrow. Uh, he taught me soils, so I'll defer to him. He knows more about soils than I do. So stay tuned for that talk. Uh, does the farm have a preservation or other conservation easement that you need to be aware of? Uh, is it farmland assessed? Do you want it to be farmland assessed? Is it even eligible to be farmland assessed? These are all important things to know before you buy. Mm -hmm. Environmental concerns. Are there streams? Are there wetlands? Is it in the pylons or highlands planning area? A lot of different farms and properties in this state will have these kind of environmental restrictions or burdens on them. There might be a certain, cla you know, a, a, a certain class of stream runs through the property and you can't farm within 300 feet of that stream where there might be wetlands that you can't disturb without getting into trouble with the DEP. So being aware of these things on the property so that you don't get into trouble down the road, these can be very expensive problems if you get into environmental issues. Um, zoning ordinances we talked about, and then I'm gonna go over site inspection and what to look at for that. So, finding farmland history, oh no, that's the next one, farm goals. Farm goals and location, not every farm is good for every type of production, so knowing what you want to produce and how you want to market it is important. Look at the other farms in the area of the farm you're considering and see what are they doing. If there's a lot of farms that are doing a similar type of agriculture, there might be a good reason for that. And it might be geographic, it might be geological, it might be market-based. You're going to find more livestock in North Jersey. There's more sloped lands, there's rockier lands, there's more marginal soils that wouldn't make great cropland, but they can be perfect for pasture and cattle and things like that. If you go down to the Pine Barrens, you're going to see lots of blueberries and cranberries. You've got soils that are naturally acidic, they've got, low, they've got low organic matter, but it works for those crops. You can grow blueberries on acidic soil that other crops would not do well on. If you want to do agritourism, you don't want a farm that's you know two hours from the nearest city. You, you're going to be in the middle of nowhere where are your customers at. So 
finding something that's close to an urban area, a suburban area, where your customer base is going to be able to come out to the farm. Does the farm look pretty? You know, does it look pretty? Does it look safe? Is it attractive? All that's going to be important if you want people to come out and do pick your own and bring the families and do hay rides. The aesthetics and the location plays an important role in that. And then the local farm community. And this goes back to conversations, getting to know the farmer. Are, are, is it a friendly farm community? Are they supportive? Are they tight-knit? Do they like to help each other out? Or is it a real adversarial, competitive, you're cutting in on my market kind of community? Both exist in New Jersey. Different municipalities are more and less supportive of agriculture, so all these are important things to look into before you purchase. For finding farmland history, um, I'm not gonna go exhaustive here, but just it is important to know what was done there in the past because that can affect what is allowed, able to be done presently. The biggest example we use for this is old apple orchards. If you've got an old orchard from like the 40s and 50s, decades ago, we're talking places where they use very harsh pesticide chemicals on those farms. So you might have cadmium, you might have arsenic. If you're investigating a farm and you know they're like, oh yeah, 80 years ago this was an apple orchard, that bell should go off and you go, all right, let me do some extra soil testing here. Let me check for heavy metals. Let me check for contaminants. You know, that applies for the groundwater there as well. Just making sure what was done there in the past so that you know what you're getting into. And again, your local Rutgers extension agent can help you and say, oh, if this was that kind of farm in the past, you really should test for X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And so places you can find that information of what was done there in the past, the current owners might tell you, or they might not, they might not want to. Neighboring farmers might know if their great-great-grandpappy knows that that place was an apple orchard and they sprayed all sorts of nasty stuff there, they might know that and be able to give you a hint. Uh, local boards of agriculture, municipal county records offices, local historical societies will have this information often. You might find books about the area. An internet search is a good starting point for this investigation, but like I said, this isn't, this isn't a, something that you're gonna plan out and find just sitting behind your computer. It's gonna involve going out, talking to people, and having these conversations. In New Jersey, is there any kind of legal requirement for people to disclose chemical usage and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. You just have to figure it out? I yourself. think it, again, boils down to a realtor's knowledge, and if they're listing it traditionally or conventionally, if they're not aware, yeah, they you know, it's kind of tough to enforce. Yeah, yeah. It's and, buyer and, yeah. And, and, and the seller might not even know. Right. You know, if they bought, yeah. if, if they or their parent bought the farm, but it was something else, you know, 70 years ago, they might not even know either. So, you know, it's it's on you to do that due diligence. So on that note, if you're going to test for soil, how deep do you got to go to get an accurate sample? Say, if it was 80 years ago, you know, how far down do you have to go? I mean, obviously, if you go a couple feet, you're probably going to. I guess you're not going to get. You don't have to go that far down. Mm -hmm. Typically, for typically for that kind of stuff, most soil testing they do is the top six to twelve inches. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got an area of particular concern, you can talk to a soil scientist. So the Rutgers Soil Test Lab is one of the great resources that Rutgers offers for testing soils. Mm -hmm. uh, the scientists there are very very good. They do heavy metals testing, and you can just say, hey, this is a concern for this property. What sorts of samples should I collect? They have do guidance documents to help walk you through that. A removal, you're on your own. If you have to do removal, or removal. do the test before you buy, and then you don't have to worry about it. And it's someone else's problem. Yeah. So I work in industry with a what's called a an I mean a uh, it's this recite this recite remediation act. Anyway, this may, this is full blown contamination. But every time we put a shovel on the ground. We're talking six thousand dollars for the battery of testing, but that is a massive battery. You're talking about T clips, toxic characteristic, lease potential. You're talking PCBs, TECEs. But the point here is that if that ground is contaminated or it's unknown, it may be best to just walk away because the last thing you want to do is buy a red hot mess yeah. Yeah. that you can't get rid of, and you just unfortunately. Your whole, I hate to be a naysayer, but your whole farm dream and the what you thought you were going to leave your children all goes up in smoke. Yeah, and you don't want to be that guy. And this happens in New Jersey. Yeah, this is happens. a real thing with, with soil, with water. And just because a farm is picturesque and pretty and looks idyllic doesn't mean anything. 
This can be deposited environmentally from rain. This can be runoff from down a stream. It could have been a toxic plume years ago. There are many different ways that soil can get contaminated. Do the testing and make sure you know for sure before you buy. Um, so farmland preservation, just to be aware, um, preserved farmland can often be more affordable than non-preserved farmland, but it comes with additional restrictions. I'm not going to go too deep into this here just for the sake of time, but just be aware when you're looking at property, is it preserved, is it not? If it's been preserved through some of the various, uh, you know, there's state, county, municipal, non-profit modes of preservation, Make sure to review the deed on that property to see what is allowed and what is not. A lot of preserved farms are specifically, you know, to only allow ag use, things that are directly related to agriculture. Some programs have an ability to apply for non-ag uses to do certain things, but it's up to you to understand that before you buy. Again, going back to our like weddings and bed and breakfasts and things like that, if it's a preserved farm, some of that stuff might not be allowed under certain programs. Farmland Assessment Act, um, I'm going to breeze through this just again for time. Farmland Assessment lowers your property taxes. If you're buying a land that is farmland assessed, you'll have to maintain a certain level of production in order to maintain that farmland assessment. If you are buying a farm that is not currently farmland assessed, just be aware that you're going to need at least two years of agriculture or horticultural production on that farm before you qualify for this tax break. Again, I wish I could go more in here, but we're coming up on time, so I'm just going to fire through. Um, site inspection, when you're actually visiting the farm, we've got a fact sheet to help with this. Here, I'll just pull it up. So I worked on this fact sheet when I was at Rutgers with Bill Lubick, Bill Erickson, and Warren Erickson. This is site considerations for new and, and established, what is it? Expanding. Expanding, that's it. New and expanding farms. Um, so this is going to talk about assessing the slope of the land. Is there flooding or ponding issues? I know you had Caitlin talk yesterday about soil drainage and erosion. You're going to talk about the aspect. What, where, where's the sunlight coming from in that field? Are you going to get enough coverage for the crops you want to grow? Um, water access and quality I briefly touched on. What's the wildlife pressure? Is there deer fencing on the property? What's parking? If you want to do agritourism, you need areas where all those customers can park safely and not be backed up on the municipal roads. Equipment access. If you've got fields that are way set back or a flag lot, or maybe you've got like a twisty, windy driveway going up, can you get, an, get a piece of equipment up there? Can you get your tractor with your boom sprayer through that to get up in the field where it needs to go? These are things to look out for when you're assessing the property. What's the current condition of the structures? Is the barn usable? Is the house usable? Are things about to fall down? Is the whole property uninsurable because the structures are so dangerous? Good These point. are things to be aware of. Uninsurable. Uninsurable property. Yeah. Um, what are the general aesthetics? We talked about this. If you want to do agritourism, you better have a pretty farm. People want to come see pretty farms. And like I said, the fact sheet goes into a lot more detail with this. So everyone, we've got paper copies you can take with you. And oh, that's you. Okay, and then I guess we'll start passing around the sign up sheet if anyone wants a copy of the presentation. Um, we'll pass it around so we don't cut into the next presenter's time. Um, so, after all that, if you still think you're ready to buy, that's awesome. Uh, next steps are lining up your financing. Again, FSA is going to be here Thursday. You're going to have to be ready with a down payment, understand the total amount of that loan you're taking out, all those additional costs that you might not uh, anticipate from just the sticker price of a farm and get all your financial documents in order. Again, you need to prove that you've done your research, that you know how you're going to pay back this loan. That's what all these financial organizations would like to see. Uh, get ready to describe your financial position and how awesome and smart you are at paying back loans. Um, and then close the deal. You might have to do some state inspections if there's buildings existing on the farm. Are they dilapidated? Uh, if you're going to use something for agritourism like a kitchen, does it meet all the food safety requirements, etc. So just more due diligence uh, in closing. And we mentioned land life that Brendan and I are the administrators as part of our new program at the state. Uh, this is an example of a listing. You can find different farmland owners. Uh, they might be looking to sell the property, to lease it. Uh, they might define it as a beginner farmer opportunity, et cetera. There's a lot of different listings. So we pulled this one up as an example. Uh, the asking price is 875000 but I did check on Zillow. It's now eight fifty. It's been reduced. It is six acres, conventional. Etc. You can get the soil description, what uh, is already existing on the farm, is there irrigation, is there a greenhouse, etc. Well, 
Uh, so again, the sale price has been adjusted, but if we do the math, um, sorry, there's a few details, but again, we'll go a little bit more quick, but we'll send you a copy. If we use the land affordability calculator, uh, let's say you have $10,000 to put down, you get an FSA direct ownership loan, which is maximum $600,000 right now. Take it out for 40 years, figure, all right, I can take my time to pay that back. It's at 5.37%. And then you cover the rest with a traditional bank loan for 30 years, and current rates are around 7% um, for the remaining 240000 So just based off those numbers uh, with that land affordability calculator, we're looking at $4,600 a month. Uh, and over that 40-year loan, you're actually going to be paying close to $2 million for that farm property with interest. So you have a big picture. This is a, yes. a six-acre farm right. with five tillers. Right. Just to keep that context clear. What was I had a friend of mine run into trouble. He bought five and a half acres thinking he could get farmland assessment. That's it. His zoning was one acre. Yeah. So he only had four and a half acres. Yeah. And he fought for years over there. Yeah, this, yeah that, is, that is I mean, a familiar I myself, story. I bought a flag lot. Yeah. I don't understand why, but I can't put a fence within 40 feet of my property line. Exactly. Because it's a flag lot. Right. My neighbors are right on the line. Right, so it's things like that that we're talking about, right? Yeah. It's, it's that, stuff that after the fact, you're like, what? Yeah. You and that five, that five acre mark, that makes a difference. And yeah. it's five acres yeah. tillable. So it's got to be five acres tillable yep. or under with the management plan and then space for the house on top. And if look at this house. Oh, it has a little stream in the back. Well, what are the rules around that stream? So that's what we're going to talk about, too. Like, what would be the due diligence here for this property, right? There's an adjacent preserved farm that's currently planting mums on the property. The posting says they don't have a contract, but is that the truth? Are you going to buy the farm and say, okay, like you can take all your mums out, and that farmer's like, what? Now you have a bad relationship with your neighbor. Um, depending, there's a small creek. Is it a, a class one, a C1 stream? You know, protected by the DEP. That's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Make sure you check that out. Uh, what condition is that house in? What condition is the well in? It's not. We're talking, five, we're talking five acres. This is a well for the house. That's right. probably 10 gallon per minute or less. You're not going to irrigate five acres off of that. Right? right. So again, this number becomes a lot more <laughs> as you do your due diligence and then maybe you consider, ah, maybe I don't want to jump in here. Or maybe you do. Maybe you have a, a friend, family member, partner who like brings in a cool meal a year and that's awesome. Go for it. <laughs> that's possible. Where are they? Please let yeah, them know. Exactly. <laughs> that's our next service that will come All up with. farm <laughs> income. Yeah. <laughs> Um, if you have 30000 to put down, that's $4,500 a month, still $2 million total with interest. And even if you have $100,000 to put down that day, you're paying $4,000 a month. So it's a lot to consider, um, and that's where the age-old joke of how do you make a million dollars farming comes from. Does anyone know the answer? Start with two million. Start with two million. <laughs> Couldn't be clearer with these numbers. Um, and then a fun but also kind of sad fact: um, the 2022 USDA Census of Ag Value Farmland in New Jersey at an average of close to sixteen thousand dollars per acre, and that's considering every single part of New Jersey. So obviously, in some areas, that number is going to be a lot higher. In some areas, it might be a bit lower. But that is the average for the state. So those are the hard numbers we're talking about here. Um, so, if financing is not the right option, uh, start small and consider leasing. That is a great way that farmers get started. Again, you're uh, developing that business history, that credit history, you're getting that experience, and you don't have that a million, two million dollar mortgage breathing down your neck for 40 years. Um, New Jersey has very low lease rates for agricultural land. If someone is just trying to get their land, uh, farmland assessed, they might just let you go do whatever you want to do for free, because it's a great benefit for them with their taxes. Um, infrastructure can be the biggest challenge for lease land. Again, no one's really investing if you're leasing it because you're not always sure about your long-term future. But we have seen examples where folks get 99-year leases, 50-year leases, et cetera, with the um, option included that it's up to you to renew at the end of that term. So essentially, you're there for, excuse me, permanently. Um, however, again, you're going to have to do due diligence, have really good, honest conversations, and take advantage of the resources out there to warn you. What do you really need on paper for these lease contracts? How do you protect yourself? Um, 
And yeah, and we've included in our printouts uh, these informal in the New Jersey guidebook. So this is a guidebook that was prepared by the State Ag Development Committee, support from the USDA a few years back. So everybody will get a copy of this. If you are interested in leasing, this can take you through some of the steps and considerations you need to look at for that. All right. And then if we want, if anyone has any questions, we'll obviously leave our contact information up here. Again, the Next Gen Farmer Program, we're trying to be that first point of contact for anybody with any questions. So we want to get you, if you are not sure about something, we can connect you with the right people. You don't have to spend hours on the internet looking like, who am I even reaching out to for this issue? Can we share your presentation with the team today? Is that possible? Oh, yeah. Uh, so no, can I, at some point in the future, mail out copies, electronic copies of your PowerPoint? Yeah, that's okay, right? that's yeah. the sign up sheet. Or, and or we can email you a copy. Okay, great, yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you all so much for your time. I know everyone's talking <laughs> Not to discourage you, but that's a lot there. And this is why I wanted to have these five people here to go over the nuances. Okay. So again, buyer beware. Know what you're getting into. We're not saying no. Right. But again, understand, right? And maybe you right. Sorry, right. It's, it's the biggest thing we see with new and beginning farmers is, you know, and, and I love it. Like a lot of people come to farming from an, an idealistic perspective. They want to grow food, they want to feed their family, they want to feed their community, they want to do a social good. And all those things are wonderful, and we don't want to discourage them, but we see far too many new and beginning farmers lead with that idealism and leave the financial and business part back here. And that leads to burnout, that leads to extra stress, that leads to challenges that you don't need to have for what's already a really challenging career. So we really, that's, we really just want to encourage people, take that time, follow these steps, do that due diligence first.